There is an essence about the Valle de Guadalupe that makes this place so special. Dirt roads lead you on a journey that just when you feel that you're lost, you see off in the distance this amazing winery surrounded by beautiful vineyards with different varietals from all over the world. That's where the real magic starts. Red and white wines are blended to create something you've never tried or heard of before. You see, winemakers in the Valle are creating their own rules, letting creativity be their guide, learning from yesterday, living for today, and hoping for a better tomorrow. For the few days that I've been here, you know, what makes this special is, again, your dirt roads, right? Your yeah. cuisine, you know, these mixed wines that I've seen, that I never thought you could find <laughs> a Zinfandel with a cab and throw in some Tempranillo, right? And you guys are doing that. We're at that point, I think, in Valle de Guadalupe, where we have amazing food, we have amazing wines, but it still maintains this um, rural feeling to it. You can drive up a dirt road for a mile and a half, two miles, you're thinking you're getting lost, and then you find this beautiful property, and you're gonna find the winery owner or the winemaker, and they're sitting there, and they can drink a glass of wine with you, and they can tell you the story for the location, you know, kind of stuff that you can't really do in in places that, that are a lot more involved, like Napa. You're never gonna sit down with a winemaker in Napa, right? Or it's gonna be super complicated to get that opportunity. So there's still this sense of personal, the family involvement, the, like you're not really getting this like super processed and commercial product. You're actually getting to the roots of what the family is doing or the original intentions of the projects when you get there. It is like a little bit of the past, trapped between places that are more modern. The winemakers, often whose families came from France or Switzerland or Italy, over time they brought different clones of the plants that they were accustomed to growing in their part of the world. Perhaps with the idea of seeing whether they would grow here. And in fact, many do grow here well. One of the advantages that we have is that uh, there's no regulation. We work open mind. Yes. <laughs> eh? And we do what we like to do, or what we suggest, or what we create, or what we invented. Which is also very important to find the proper way. Valle Guadalupe being so close to the ocean and having this uh, Mediterranean weather, I can say that it's very versatile. We can grow a bunch of varieties down here that maybe not other countries can explore in that. But from my experience and what I have in our state is uh, mostly Bordeaux. But then again, you see also the Spanish, the, the Tempranillos, then the Italian, the Nebbiolos. The temperature, of course, is, is very, very good. Uh, the clean air, it's very close to the ocean. And um, it's never too hot and never too cold. It seems easier than other countries. And the freedom, of course, we don't have a DOC which means that uh, we can do what we want. We don't have to stick with this varietal. I don't know how long that will hold, of course, but you know, we can give the plants water every day if we want. It's not like in France where we have to wait for the rain to come. So there's a lot of freedom here. Here, I took two different soil, clay and sand. In the summer, the condition is very well. It's very warm, the hot, and the night is cooler because you're very, very close to the sea. And the grapes, it's, it's, it's very good <laughs> for the ground. Uh, it's very interesting. What are you seeing right now growing really well? I know you talked about Tempranillo. Mm. And the yeah. Tempranillos, Nebbiolos, Cabernet Sauvignons are very good. Down here in the whites, I also see Muscata Alejandria. I see the Chenin Blancs. I see Geburtstraminers. I see all sorts of grapes, especially not just Valle Guadalupe. A lot of people think that Valle Guadalupe is the only place where uh, Baja California makes wine. There's different, they're not known as AVAs, but there's different AVAs in Valle Guadalupe. So if you go a little bit south, into Baja California, there's whole different climates that, are, that I know that they're at least planting Pinot Noirs and the Gewurz yeah. down there. It's not set yet yeah. what yeah. grows well here, especially with uh, Mother Nature giving us rain one season and then the other one a drought and then the next one a lot of heat. So I mean, I wouldn't say at least in my 10 years of experience that a certain variety is growing very well. I think most of them are doing very well, just I haven't found the one that exceeds my expectations at the moment. When I came, everybody was into the Tempranillo. Tempranillo is what we have, what we're going to do here. And we did. 
And then, of course, I think, you know, somebody came with some Nebbiolo, and now Nebbiolo is hot, you know? So it's, maybe that's not even the end of it. It just, maybe we go through some more varietals. So Nebbiolo is one of the big grapes that we have here. It's adapted very well. I'm sure you're gonna hear this many times during the interviews. We have this Mexican Nebbiolo, which is not really the same thing as the Italian Nebbiolo, but it's adapted fantastically well to the region, and it's also, very interesting because Nebbiolo is usually considered an endemic grape to Italy. You only really produce it in Italy and in Mexico, that's it. So it's super interesting for people, for wine drinkers all over the world, hear about this Nebbiolo coming out of Mexico and trying it and seeing similarities, but also the differences that it has to a Barolo, right, or a Barbaresco. So Nebbiolo is one of the big grapes. Uh, when it comes to red grapes, I think Syrah is eventually gonna crawl its way all the way to the top here. We've played a little bit with Tempranillo. It's sort of like taking a step back recently, but I think it's still one of our main players for the region. And then with white grapes, Chenin Blanc is growing super fast and over the last couple of years. So that's really adapting well to the weather. Now we are on the on time that we are closing the roads. We are focusing uh, much more than 20 years ago when it started, everybody was making wine. Today is much more professional and it's reflected to the quality of the wine. So the quality of the one is very well recognized around the world. All the people that taste it recognize the quality. We haven't yet had to decide which are the grapes that we should be planting here. It's been okay to keep alive those which have been here for a long time. As it's getting hotter and the rains are coming less frequently, I'm sure it will be that we won't need to decide that. Climate will decide that for us. There's one person, Camilo Magoni, I believe he has about 120 different types of grape himself, perhaps only one row of each. But he's the kind of person who's been collecting the information that in the future other people will need. When you first got here and you started the planting vineyards, what was the evolution of the varietals like from when you first started to now? Originally, we had the traditional grapes, like Mission, some Carignan, some Sinfandel, some Tempranillo, which was imported from California. We started introducing Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, all the noble varieties, the noble variety. and that was the, the development of the variety. What should I expect as a uh, a drinker here. Should I expect some sort of varietal? Should I keep an open mind? What, what would you like to pass on to some of the people that come in for the very first time? Please keep an open mind. Yeah. We do produce quite a few wines which are single varietals, but we are known for making blends. I make a, a couple of reds which consist of only one grape. One is 100% Tempranillo. It doesn't really taste like the Tempranillos of Spain, and I never intended that it would. I and many other people try to make wines probably in the most natural way possible. Let the wines make themselves. Let the Tempranillo be what it wants to be, or at least be what it naturally ends up being. You are in a region that we have no rules. When I say we have no rules, there's people making crazy things. For example, we have a blend that we make 50% Tempranillo, 50% Nebbiolo, which is a real blend that no one's know, but we, we make it, people like it, and, and that makes, makes us unique as a winery, you know? In some parts of the world, it's actually illegal to do that. If you're selling your wine as a, a wine at a certain level, with a certain legal description, you must make it as you always did and as your parents and grandparents did. We don't have those laws. In other countries, you're obliged to plant certain grapes in order to protect the quality of the wines in that area. Some time ago now, laws were passed to determine what you will plant, how you will plant it, and where you're allowed to plant it. If you make it different wines, different blending, whatever you want to put in the, in the, in the label. Yes, it's very exciting yeah. because, for example, this rosé, I have uh, six different grapes put together and nothing, <laughs> no problem with that, that part. No? Because all those different grapes are available, I can now make blends with perhaps grapes which only normally are found in Germany, Italy and France, but you won't find them all together. 
here you do. And so we can make a lot of unusual blends. We do, I certainly do. And I think it, to go back to your question, it would be a good idea to have an open mind because you'll find many wines here that you won't find in other places. There's difficult years, there's good years. So you can play whatever. When you said, uh, we don't have an identity, this is the, the one that we have. We can do whatever we want. We can play whatever we want. We can blend French with uh, Italians. Italians with the Spaniards, whatever. There is no rules, so, and people are really appreciating what we have right now. Don't judge us if you have never tried us. Once you, you try our wines, you can say whatever you want, but don't uh, make any judgment before you, you try it. I don't know if it's the right moment for maybe Mexico to be known for a grape, because 80% of the wine being made in Mexico is made in the northern part, which is uh, Baja California, Valle Guadalupe. I wouldn't say that there's a, just certain types, I would say Mexico has different climates, different terroir that can grow a very vast variety yeah. of, of varietals. What are some of the challenges that you face? Water. The, water. the first one is water. We have a drought situation in Southern California, a big one. Reclaim water is a is main change. So right now we're very limited on what is actually planted on a terrace or on a hillside and really I hope that in the future we start to explore that. Biggest issue really will be water at one point or another as water is life and water being life here and you know, yeah. for, for, uh, for the vineyard of course and the more vineyard that's being planted out there you know the more uh, need for water that we'll have and really I think that we have the the ability to play with some pretty cool blends you know we have this Naviolo Mexicano which uh, yeah. really is isn't even a uh, viniferous varietal, it's a Labrusca that, you know, is, is one of the flagships to the valley and it does damn well. So I, I think that, that that's really what's more exciting, that, that we don't have to necessarily make cab blends, we don't necessarily have to make, you know, a Rhone style blend like the Rhone Rangers out on the Central Coast are trying to do. All that we're trying to do is make the best blends that work uh, for, for everybody that comes to enjoy them. So I think that here, um, you know, once again, with that pride that comes from, from being from Valle, yeah. you're already a very proud, you know, people here in, in Valle de Guadalupe. But I think that they, they haven't really even scratched the surface yet, to be honest yeah. with you. I think Mexico is in a little bit of an identity crisis. I don't know, you know, I go to other regions and they're like, hey, you know, Burgundy, yeah. damn, Chardonnay, you know. You know what you're gonna get. You come here, yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna get. I talked to other winemakers and they're saying, you know what, we're about our blends. I think it's an, a mistake to consider it an identity crisis. Yeah. Mexicans have always been about that blending and what we call in Spanish mestizaje, right? So the combination of different like races and identities and cultures. Think about Mexican food. Usually when you think about Mexican food, if you start really thinking about it, okay, you've got tacos, you've got mole, but also you have the food from the Yucatan Peninsula is completely different. And then you move further north and then you have all the seafood from uh, Sinaloa and the fish tacos from Baja California, flour tortillas and the flour tacos from Sonora. And you start realizing that if you look at Mexican cuisine, would you consider that to also be an identity crisis? You wouldn't, right? So that's sort of the same thing that's happening right now with wine. We are all about experimenting and doing different things and crazy things. Eventually, the market will lead us to our most successful varietals and our most successful blends or single varietals in this case. But as of right now, winemaking in Mexico is a reflection of our culture and of our food. You were mentioning that Mexican wine seems to pair fantastically well with Mexican food. There you go. How can you say there's an identity crisis when you see this every time you sit down, have lunch with wine, right? It's not an identity crisis. That's actually our identity. So yeah. No, that's awesome. I love that.